Garden. And thanks to the organising committee for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'm going to talk about dairy in, in Canterbury, and actually, I don't spend a lot of my time um, dealing with dairy farmers. And tomorrow, I'll talk about dryland farmers, which are sheep farmers, which I do spend a lot of my time. What I want to do is just outline the farm and region and describe the land use changes and environmental impacts um, that have occurred and think about the science basis and farmer responses to those land use changes and then potentially look at solutions that might come along, the solutions that the market, the legislation and the science community may actually give us. In, this is New Zealand, for those that don't recognise it. Um, the, there's a string of mountains, a bit like the Alps, that run right up the middle of the country. And on the left hand side, as you look at the diagram, it's wet. And that's the wet for west coast, and two metres of rainfall is not uncommon there. But we have sort of the mistral effect on the east coast, and it's very dry. And so if you don't have um, irrigation, then you have a very short growing season, um, 500, 600 mil rainfall environment. And that's what the Canterbury Plains looks like. It's a very good place to grow things. We grow good all lacks. We grow the world record wheat crops, we grow onions, we grow white clover seeds, we grow wine, we grow high value seed crops. And traditionally we've also had this as being mixed cropping with a whole lot of sheep and beef production occurring as well. And that led um, Addiscott and his, his seminal work on nitrate agriculture to, to describe the Canterbury Plains in the South Island of New Zealand is depending almost entirely on nitrogen fixed by clover and being highly productive. This is a highly productive region. But with drought scenarios coming along and an excess of water availability, we're one of the regions that if you dig down you will find water. It, it is basically an aquifer. The whole of the plains is a, is a gravel aquifer. So they did. And we've irrigated 230,000 hectares and we have reduced the sheep numbers in Canterbury and as a consequence, well, the displacement has been an increase in dairy cows. So Hugo mentioned it's 1.4. There's 1.4 million dairy cows in about a 20 year period. Rapid expansion of the dairy industry. And so with that has come rapid expansion of the use of nitrogen fertiliser. So now we have some of the highest stocking rates in the world, three and a half cows per hectare. If a cow consumes about four and a half thousand kilos, you need to grow about 20 tonnes of dry matter to fully feed those cows. To grow 20 tonnes of um, dry matter, you need a lot of nitrogen. The herds are 780 cows as an average, but there are herds of two and a half, three thousand cows on one farm. There's been a big public backlash because we did have a very diversified landscape and now, as you can see in the foreground, we have a monoculture of perennial ryegrass. What happens when you take that dry land pasture that was growing sheep and you pour water on it is not very much. So if we fully irrigate that land, we go from producing six tonnes of dry matter to 10 tonnes of dry matter, certainly nowhere near the 20 tonnes that we need to be able to feed three and a half cows per hectare. What actually you need is nitrogen. And so that's why we've seen that huge increase in nitrogen fertiliser being used in, in New Zealand. So the environment allows us to actually quite easily grow 20 tonnes of um, perennial ryegrass provided there's nitrogen put with it. And so there's been about an increase of about 8,500 tonnes per year since 2002 of um, nitrogen put into the Canterbury Plains. What you've got to think about is, well, how much nitrogen is that to produce 20 tonnes of dry matter? Well, if we use um, a nitrogen nutrition index, we can actually work that out. We're harvesting at about 3 tonnes of dry matter, so we need about 3.8% nitrogen to multiply that by let's call it 4, multiply by 6.25, it's 22-23% um, crude protein. The difficulty is that 22-23% crude protein when you harvest it with an animal is actually too much for the animal. It then has to excrete the nitrogen because it only needs about 18% crude protein. So the extra crude protein is a waste that it has to get rid of and it gets rid of that in its urine, just as you excrete nitrogen in your urine. So it disappears and we have a thousand kilos of N deposited in the urine patch, but we actually still have nitrogen deficient pastures. 
And so what we did was actually have a look at some farms and see, well, what are they trying to do to deal with this um, difficulty they have? They know that they don't really want to create drainage. They don't want to leach nutrients out of the system. So some of them are very good at the irrigation. And in this case, a farmer, most of these farmers try to use around 200 kilos of N because they've heard that that's okay. Maybe I shouldn't use more than that. So about 200 kilos of N. And this farmer's grown 14.9 tonnes of perennial ryegrass. He will have to buy in a lot of feed. This farmer grew 12 tonnes of dry matter from his 170 kilos of nitrogen, but drained about 400 millimetres through his um, soil profile. Equally, this farmer only grew 10 tonnes of dry matter from 200 kilos of N and drained about 300 uh, millimetres of water. What's effectively happening here is a tragedy of the commons. In New Zealand, nobody owns the water. When we were colonised, the Maori owned everything. And anything that the indigenous people were not, did not sell, they owned. And nobody bought the water. So nobody owns the water. So it's a political difficulty of how do you actually then start charging people for the use of water. So effectively the water is a resource that is available to anyone that wants to use it including bottling companies that come in from all parts of the world and bottle the water because it's pristine and send it all over the world to be drunk. There are only two geological structures of similar um, purity, the other is Eliade in France. So that's why the water is, is that pure. It's essentially a gravel aquifer. So what we have is over-fertilised, uh, over-irrigated and under-fertilised pastures despite a huge increase in um, nitrogen being used. This is a, an indication of the nitrogen nutrition index. It needs to be about 0.8 for the pasture to be getting all of the nitrogen that it actually requires. And you can see quite clearly that it isn't. These are the soils. So calling them soils is actually doing them a real service. They're effectively gravels that have been produced from um, the major rivers that flow from the mountains to the sea with a little bit of sand thrown in between and some topsoil developing on the top. So our farmers are trying to be environmentally conscious, they um, fence off the waterways, they do the best they can, but actually we're still going to have a catchment that is going to have an increase in nitrate leaching, and that's what we have. We have a catchment that has increased nitrate. Not from the use of the fertiliser, from those urine patches that are being produced by the dairy cows, because they're never housed. We don't have all of the flows that Hugo was telling us, because we don't basically put the animals indoors. We're not taking the feed to them and we're not removing their excrement. But we do have a problem in that we have a closed system. This is a freshwater lake and the major development of the dairy farms has happened in this catchment here and in this catchment here. So effectively the um, nitrate comes into this lake. This lake and um, the one next to it both have reasonable levels of phosphorus already because there's a lot of hill country here and so there's sediment in it. So the potential for eutrophication is very high. So we have a number of solutions. The market solution has been pollution. The market has ruled for the last 15 years and effectively the expansion of the dairy farming has been um, done with no legislation and no controls on anything that was done. We've had a change of government. In fact, this was one of the issues that changed the government in our last election, was the quality of water in New Zealand, and particularly to do with the rivers and the lakes. And they're not bad by international standards. They're actually still very good. But New Zealanders are very keen on maintaining that pristine condition. So we have a, um, a legislative process occurring where a model is uh, being used called Overseer that's modeling nitrogen outputs. There is no limitation on the amount of N that farmers can use, but they are not allowed to exceed certain outputs. So they are developing best management practices and farm environmental plans for them. But it generates perverse outcomes. If you were a farmer who was already um, leaching 100 kilos of N, then you can still leach 100 kilos of N, they've grandparented. Whereas a farmer who was leaching 5 kilos of N is only allowed to leach 5 kilos of N. So there's some difficulties there and some tension occurring between the different livestock industries around the use of such a model that really hasn't been uh, thought through terribly well. So have we got any scientific solutions? Well, we might reduce stocking rates, we need to deal with the outdoors uh, wintering, and we might increase stocking rates. All, all bets are on. 
Here's the 9.8 tonnes I was talking about. Um, it's about 3.3 3 kilos of dry matter per degree C day, and there's 7 kilos that you get from irrigation plus nitrogen. We have an option of biological nitrogen fixation. If we get about 30 kilos of um, nitrogen fixed from every tonne of legume that we grow, the more legume we grow, we've got more fertiliser, but we have the opportunity of increasing uh, legume content. What happens in the milk system is that as you increase the legume content, you decrease the dry matter production. So the relative yield declines because the legumes don't generate as much um, feed. But what happens to the milk solids per cow is it goes up. And here it's gone up to about, uh, at, at about 40 to 50%. You can see there's a 30% increase in milk yield possible. And if you put that on to milk solids per hectare, the maximum value that you're looking for is about 60% legume. If you've got about 60% legume, then that's um, actually going to not change or increase your milk solid production. But it's difficult to maintain clover in a grazed pasture. It's not very competitive and the animals um, tend to favour it so it gets grazed out. But there are ways of doing it. There are other pastures other than ryegrass being used. There are low sowing rates of ryegrass being used, 8 kilos rather than traditional 20s. And we have plantain being used with clover because plantain um, increases urinary flow, so it increases the number of urine events that occur and therefore you decrease the concentration of urine. We've also got some farmers who are now getting part of their legume diet from directly grazing on the legume. So here we've got a couple of hours of grazing before the uh, morning milking and we might have a couple of hours grazing on the irrigation before we go elsewhere. Deficit irrigation management is likely to occur so that we prevent these um, drainage events occurring and we've had Edith um, talking earlier about catch crops. So the use of crops to pick up the nitrogen that's deposited from our wintering systems. We may also end up with um, indoor systems, high stocking rates, with the ability to grow crops that we have. We can certainly do that. We can grow cereals and total mixed rations. But our solutions um, are not, the biology has to be dealt with. The market has failed. Policy will force change. Um, recently, policy is headed towards nitrate, but it will increasingly move towards methane. Hopefully, it will be informed by science. I say hopefully because there is a history, and, and the EU is one of the places that has a history of having policy without science. And so, we will end up with divergent systems either a low cost legume system with a low stocking rate and high per cow performance, which would take us back to the future, or a house, high cost, high stocking rate TMR which is unlikely to be accepted on the plains because the public want animals to be seen grazing outside. I'll leave it there. My presentation will be on this website if anybody wants to get it. Thank you. Uh, so, maybe one or two questions. What was the motivation behind Money. Thank you. Simply, um, the farmers have an opportunity to do whatever you want. So high value crops, radish seed production is also useful, but you can't do that everywhere. The difficulty is that historically you could choose your crop based on what you thought the return would be. Once you put a dairy infrastructure in, you've got centre pivot irrigation, you've got a, a, a dairy there, it becomes more difficult. What, what is the market for your data? I, I, I have seen uh, products from New Zealand in the UK supermarket. Absolutely. And we produce it cheaper than the UK farmers. So 96% of our milk is actually exported. So it's an incredibly efficient system um, and we, we set the milk price really. Yeah. It's the biggest industry in the country, um, $14 billion. It's about 25% of our GDP. We're not trying to reduce production. We don't want organic production to drop our production by 20% because then I won't get my head replacement when I need it. Thank you. Uh, maybe one more. I'm just wondering about the grazing plan of the dairy cows. The, the grazing time, they're out door grazing. Yeah, so 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 they're